I'm gonna share a little bit about myself with you all. My name is Mara Walsh, as I said. I am dialing in from the United States and specifically between Philadelphia and New York. I'm on the Northeast coast of the United States. I started leading physical tours with EF tours as a Girl Scout leader, taking girls and their families to international destinations every summer. I have since expanded my physical travel program and added adult only tours as well as family friendly tours. It seems like a long time ago since we've actually been physically traveling, but um, when I do physically travel, I do tend to use EF Tours or their adult division go ahead tours as my travel partner. I do also do some customized tours that, um, th that are groups as well. There are a couple reasons I started this video tour series, and one was really for our tour director community. We ha I have several colleagues and friends that are tour directors, and because of the travel restrictions that have been put in place about a year ago, most of them have not been able to work in that time. So I thought it would be a good opportunity for us to share some of their knowledge and also give us the opportunity to tip them for them to make some money. The second reason I started this virtual tour series was because I really wanted to keep my group, my travel group engaged in travel. And we have extended that opportunity to those of you who have found us through Facebook, friends, family, and other social media. So welcome to everybody. We appreciate you being here. We have done several tours in the past year since COVID struck. We started this series in May of last year. I can't believe it's almost a year at this point. If you've missed any of them and you wanna go back, please go to my website, girltraveltours.com and look for the virtual tours drop-down menu. I'm going to um, share a screen with you right now, which gives you our upcoming tours. And it also gives you the website address to view all upcoming tours as well as past tours. If you are on Zoom, I just popped that uh, URL into the chat so you can copy it from there if you'd like. We have several more tours planned for 2021 and they're listed on my website as well as on the slide. We are soon going to visit Iceland, Lucerne in the Alps, Budapest. We're gonna do a Royals virtual tour. We'll go to Ontario and Quebec, the Vatican City, we're gonna do a British tour, a, a musical tour of Britain. We're going to Antarctica, Andalusia, Jerusalem, Belgium, and we're going to add a virtual visit to Mexico for Cinco de Mayo. As long as you're interested in viewing these virtual tour presentations, we will continue to produce them. I know that many of you found us on Facebook and this is my, um, my big warning that every week I just want you to know that if you are taken to a site that asks for a credit card to enter a virtual tour, please do not give your credit card information. There are so many people on Facebook that have scammed uh, other legitimate tour companies and pages. And what they do is they copy our, our events and our pages and they pretend that they're us except when you click through, then they ask for a credit card. So I'm just gonna say, do not give a credit card in order to enter a virtual tour unless, you know, unless for any reason you're comfortable giving away your money at that point. But, but please know that that's just not legitimate in most cases. Okay, so before we get started, as I said, I want you to feel free to use the Q&A and the chat mechanism. I'm gonna launch a poll just to give us an understanding of where people are dialing in, um, not, not where they're dialing in from, but what their interest is in Belfast. So um, here are my choices. What's your connection to Bel Belfast? I've been in Love It. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the destination and its history, or I am solely interested in, ex in experiencing it virtually. If I were to answer this question today, I would say I have been and loved it. Um, I have been to Ireland so many times in my life um, from the time I was 20 until now, but last summer was the first time I had been to Belfast. So I was really excited to see the North um, and also to learn more closely about its history and the troubles as it's called. So I'm going to share the poll with you right now. And what you'll see is that most people are very interested in the topic matter, and that makes Lewis and I very happy 
because that means that hopefully you'll love the presentation that we're gonna give today. So uh, I'm going to share the results with the audience. You'll see that about half of you are interested in the destination. There's a pretty decent amount, about 30% who have been to Northern Ireland and Belfast specifically. So that's awesome as well. I'm gonna stop sharing the poll. If you still have the poll that's coming up on your Zoom, to, your Zoom interface, just click the top left button and it will take it away um, so that you're not seeing it. Okay, so today's tour and all of our tours are scheduled for 90 minutes plus the Q&A. So I hope you're ready with your snacks and your drinks in hand or your coffee or tea if you're coming in from Australia or the other side. Um, a tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour director. A tour director is like a personal travel concierge who stays with your group from start to finish. Uh, they make all of the travel plans. They make sure that it's stressless and you don't have any hiccups along the road. They are amazing people and they are by far the most important person in a tour group. If you're not traveling um, right now, Obviously, our tour directors are not working. So I will share in the chat and the Q&A in a little bit of time where you can go to tip the tour director if you're so inclined and if you enjoyed this presentation. Um, let's see. I'm hoping that this virtual tour will not only reignite your desire to travel, but it will also give our tour director something, um, some time to do what he does best, which is really share his knowledge and his passion for travel and for history. Today, we're lucky to have back one of our favorite tour directors, who is a huge historian, ready to share his knowledge of the Republic and the Loyalists and just what the Troubles were all about. I am honored to introduce you to and hand over this event to our amazing tour director, Lewis. Lewis, if you're ready, you can take yourself off mute. You can grab the controls, share your screen, and take us to Belfast. Thanks. Mara, can you, can you see me just now? You can see me. Okay, I can't see myself, but I'm going to share the screen and hope that you can all see me and that that will be okay anyway. Okay. You're perfect. I'm perfect. Okay, my only thing is that I cannot see myself. Oh, there I am. Excellent. Great. Okay. Um good evening or good morning or good afternoon to everybody um for those of you that haven't been on one of these tours one of these presentations that i've done before uh maybe what i'll, I'll start with is i'll just introduce myself a little bit uh so my name is lewis uh i'm from scotland i grew up in in edinburgh and i lived there until i was 18 and then i moved to glasgow where i lived for about 11 years before moving to the south of france to marseille which is where i'm calling you from tonight so here where i am it's just after 11 o'clock at night, we're, we're a bit ahead of most of you. Um, and I've been working for EF doing these tours for just over a decade. So for 11 years, or maybe this year is my 12th year. Uh, and I've mostly been doing that work with, with teenagers. Um, and since the very, very beginning of my time with EF, uh, I was always traveling to and working a lot in, in Ireland. Um, and that means in the Republic of Ireland, but also in the north, in the six counties, um, which would make up the, the, what we call Northern Ireland, which remains part of the, the UK. Um, I always really liked working in Ireland. I, I found it a really nice place to work. People were really friendly. I found the history very, very interesting. Um, globally, kind of in, in Ireland as, as a country and as an island, it's a very sort of revolutionary history, a very sort of rebellious history. Um, and I guess having lived in Glasgow for a long time as well, Belfast and some of the sort of contradictions and the sort of political questions that played out in Belfast over the last half century felt relevant to me also because uh, many of them spilled into Glasgow and into Scottish life in lots of different ways. For example, football rivalries, but maybe I'm going to talk about that a bit later. Um, and so I guess I'm happy to do this tour or to do this presentation tonight. Um, I've done a few of these now. Uh, and I guess in my job, usually we're kind of towing the line somewhere between tourism and, um, and then this kind of other kind of work, which is kind of genuinely trying to learn and really understand about other people's cultures, their histories, their practices, in order to kind of change our perspective on things. And so I guess with this tour tonight, this presentation, um, it's going to be less on the tourism, less on this first side and more on this second side. Okay. 
Um, so for those of you that um, know, like know me, have been on these tours before, I'm going to promise I'm going to try and not get too stuck in like really, really old history. I know I have a bit of a tendency to get a bit um, blocked in the 15th century or whatever. I'm going to try really hard not to do that. Um, but basically my idea for this trip tonight is that I want to try and explain to you all why Ireland was partitioned, uh, what, what built up in Irish history to mean that the island was split into two different countries like it is today, uh, and to bring us up to the 20th century and then to give you a bit of a history about the Troubles, okay, so the Troubles is this period between 1969 and 1998. And then to go for a little walk, starting in West Belfast, which is a traditionally Catholic Republican area, and then crossing crossing the divide. Okay, seeing the other side of the fence, and having a look at some of the things that we could see in, in Protestant loyalist areas like the Shank Hill today in Belfast. And at the end, we'll look at some kind of things that aren't related towards this to this history, because obviously there are also other things in Belfast other than this complicated political history. So that's kind of my plan. That's what I'm going to talk to you. I'm thinking it's going to take about. 50 minutes, something like that. That's five zero, not one five. And I guess I started with this image um, as the beginning. Obviously, it's a mural. This tour, this presentation is going to be a lot about murals, okay? Because mural culture is a really important part of the political culture in the north of Ireland, in the six counties. And I guess it's interesting because murals are a way when you don't have so much space, or you don't have so much resources, so many resources, murals are a way to kind of take up public space with your ideas, okay, and to, and to make them louder. And I like this image as well, because it's obviously then been painted layers over different layers, okay, which is for me a bit sort of symbolic of, of some of the ways in which this conflict has developed. And so you can see the shape of the island of Ireland with the green, white and orange, green for, for Catholics and for Republicans, white for uh, loyalists and, and Protestants, sorry, orange and white for peace. And you can see the tagline says, Ireland, a nation, Irish and free, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace. And if we look at this next image um, of a British soldier squatting down while this woman walks with um, these two kids in a pushchair, I feel like this is the image that a lot of people um, have of, of Belfast when they think about Belfast in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s um, as being kind of a war zone. Uh, but being a war zone where it wasn't one country versus another country, but a kind of state of civil war. And to, to many extents, that, that's true. So often we say when we're talking about Belfast and, and we're talking about Northern Ireland, we talk about the conflict as being between Catholics and Protestants. Uh, and to someone that hadn't really thought so much about this history, that could make it seem like this is a religious conflict. But in fact, it's not really about religion. It's much more about culture, about nationality, uh, and about cultural values and, and how they express themselves. Okay, so in general, with these 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 conversations around the troubles, you've got to be careful, and we've got to be careful about how we talk. We've got to measure our words, and so obviously, it can never be simplified this much. But to very put into sort of two sentences what the troubles were, the troubles was basically this period from from 1969 to 1998 where Catholics, who at that time were in a minor minority in Northern Ireland, um, they did not have the same access to civil rights as Protestants, okay? And so they made a movement, a social movement in the 1960s in order to try and get these, these, these rights back. Protestants on the other side didn't really believe that this social movement was about that and thought that it was more nationalist. What they wanted actually was Ireland to unite itself again. Uh, and this caused a huge amount of violence between the two sides which invariably then involved the police, who were invariably Protestant. And this then turned into, um, in, into basically paramilitary warfare. So a kind of civil war between armed groups in these two communities. And this repeatedly sucked the British in, who deployed many, many thousands of soldiers to try and control the situation. So basically it's this kind of 30 year period of very intense um, conflict in this very small country. So that's the image that people have of Belfast, certainly a lot of older people, that's the image that they have of Belfast. Um, but in fact, Belfast today, it's a kind of fairly normal, um, fairly bustling European city, all right? There we have the town hall in the center. You know, it's a place where people go to university, where people go out to eat, which has, uh, you know, nightclubs, uh, shopping centers, sports attractions. It's a, it's a fairly sort of normal city. And they're working hard to, to get away, not to necessarily to get away from the image that they've had over the last 30, 40 years, but kind of to move on, or at least some parts of the community are. Um, 
so here we are at this map. So you can have a look a little bit at what the kind of layer of the land is now in the whole island of Ireland. You can see that you have the Republic of Ireland, which is this big country on the bottom, and then Northern Ireland, uh, which stays part of the UK. So the UK being obviously Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So obviously you can imagine this throws up big questions for Brexit. Maybe I thought that was something could be something we could come back to in the questions at the end. But for now, I just wanted to show you this map. And I want to, in this first part of the presentation, basically just try and take some time to try to explain to you how we got up into this situation that the country was partitioned like this, okay? Because these are two officially different countries. Uh, for now, I will tell you though that um, in the Republic of Ireland in general, so the area in green on the map, you have a population something like 95% Catholic. Okay? It's a very predominantly Catholic country. And in Northern Ireland, when Northern Ireland was first made, Catholics were very much in a minority, but actually slowly but surely it is changing. And now in Northern Ireland, you have 48% Protestants, 45% Catholics. Okay. And so they're saying that in time, slowly but surely, the Catholic minority is disappearing. It's becoming a majority. So how did this island get partitioned? So if you've been, if you were in the presentation, the tour that I did in Scotland, you'll remember me talking about Celts. Ireland was at its, at its base, a Celtic country. Bear in mind, it's a sort of small island, about the size of Virginia, the whole of Ireland. Ireland. It's a small island on the very, very extreme west of Europe, okay? So to some extent, it, it was quite sheltered from, from certain things in, in the development of civilization in Europe, but it was very much victim to waves of invasions, okay? So you had the Celts were the first people here, and then in the 700s, and, and also the Celts, I should say also, that gave Ireland a lot of its language. You know, Ireland today, certainly in the Republic of Ireland, you have people speaking the Irish language, uh, Gaelic. Uh, in the north of Ireland, that would be seen as a, a sign of membership of, of the Catholic community, if you had sort of signs or posters or road signs in, in your neighborhood in, in Gaelic. So Gaelic culture comes from, from the indigenous Celtic culture to Ireland. After the Celts, you had the Vikings that came from the 7th, 700s on. They had huge big success in Ireland uh, and they really sort of colonized and settled in Ireland. And Ireland actually has been one of the most important places for finding sort of Viking artifacts um, and ruins. The biggest ever discovery of Viking artifact outside of Scandinavia was in fact in Dublin under the, basically in the parking of the city hall in the 1970s. And then in the 1100s, so you can see this map from 1171, you had the last big invasion of, of Ireland, and this was by the Normans. Now the Normans, they had invaded England in 1076, all right? People talk about that as being the last invasion of England. And when they invaded in 1070, 1066 in England, they were kind of French, okay? The dividing line between French and English in this whole period of the Middle Ages is always a bit muddy. Um, it's kind of really more a story of just a bunch of different old rich households fighting for power rather than actually necessarily anything to do with nationality. So they invaded England in 1066 and by the time they got to Ireland they kind of were just English. So 1171 is the date that we count as the beginning of English rule in Ireland. Okay so the English will then go on to rule Ireland for more than 900 years. And I'm sure you know this already, that historically, certainly if you've been on any of Mara's other trips to Ireland, historically relationships between the Irish and Ireland and England are not good, okay? And uh, have been very sort of um, relationships steeped in colonialism uh, uh, and steeped in um, disrespect, I guess you could say, um, and which have changed since Ireland had their revolution. So... Even here, you can see, look, there's still down around Cork in the bottom, in the very bottom of this map, still Viking territory. Um, but principally here, we're talking about, yeah, an invasion of the English who arrive into Dublin and who push up and into the country. Uh, this is the Normans invading Ireland here. We're then going to go on for three, four hundred years, sort of between 1100s and um, the beginning of the 16th century where the English are going to rule Ireland and Ireland and the Irish people are going to get basically poorer and poorer and poorer and the English are going to get richer and richer and richer and the English are mostly going to be living in sort of Dublin okay this is the, the area that's going to get really built up um, and everything around that is going to be the pale beyond the pale okay and that's where the sort of wild Irish will live and so in this period this between the 12th century and the 16th century um, Irish society at the sort of grassroots level, ordinary people get poorer and poorer and poorer and poorer. 
when we arrive in the 16th century, the beginning of the 16th century, we have the Reformation, um, which is really, really, really important for our purposes today. I'm going to try and not get too stuck here. This is, I often get a bit stuck here just because I'm fascinated by the, the period. But basically elsewhere in, in Europe, you have the Reformation that gets taken on by people like Martin Luther. In England, in the British Isles, it was taken on by Henry VIII. Um, and he basically, before the Reformation, everyone was Catholic. Okay, most people were Catholic in Europe. Um, and the Reformation was this kind of big, broad movement to reform the Catholic Church and to make a new branch of the church. And old Henry VIII, he basically really wanted to get a divorce and the Pope wouldn't let him. And so he triggered the Reformation. He basically made a new church of which he was the Pope. And that church was the Church of England. Okay, so that happens in the beginning of the 16th century. And obviously that's going to have big consequences for a place like Ireland, because Ireland is like, firstly, 100% Catholic at this point. I mean, really, really 100, 100, 100% 100 Catholic. But also, Ireland hates the king, right? So you can imagine that that makes some quite complicated sentiments. Because, for example, if you're in Edinburgh or you're in Manchester or you're in Cardiff or you're in London and you've been Catholic forever, but you're loyal to the king, and suddenly the king's like, right, we're done with Catholicism, everyone's going to be Anglican now. What are you going to do? You're going to become Anglican, okay, to show your political allegiance. So the Irish were in this funny situation where suddenly the people that led them from far away and led them badly and disrespectfully wanted them to renounce Catholicism. And obviously they didn't really want to. So you have this unusual situation for any of you that have traveled Europe. You know, that there's lots of countries like France or Poland um, or Italy where Catholicism remains the establishment. It remains the sort of the powerful dominant religious force in, in Christianity. But actually in Ireland and Scotland and England, Catholics in many ways became not necessarily a minority, it's not necessarily the right word, but they became certainly not the establishment. And so in fact, it's produced this weird situation where for example, in Scotland or Ireland today, to be Catholic would maybe make you more likely, for example, to have left-wing political tendencies, where in, yeah, for example, Italy or Poland, to be Catholic would probably push you more towards the right politically. So Henry VIII does the Reformation. This is the other place where I get stuck is James I. I'm not going to get stuck. James I, there's a couple of kings and queens after Henry VIII. James I is really, really the most important one for our story. Um, because James I takes part in something called the Ulster Plantation. So if you look at this map here, this is the map that's going to give us the key to this story. So if we go back, let's look at James's face before, while we tell the story. So basically, James, super, super important king. He was a Scottish king. He was on the throne for about 30 years in Scotland. And then he moved out to London to take the throne. And, and he became James I. He had been James VI in Scotland. He was really important for our history in lots of reasons, in lots of ways. Firstly, he was a big, 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 big time Protestant, all right? So the King James Bible, which I'm sure many of you would ha have in your homes, gets its name from, from this King James. And also he began with the colonization of the Americas. So if you think about Jamestown, okay, that gets its name from him. So he was a really kind of outward reaching king that was seeking for, to change a lot of things in the world. And one of the things he wanted to do was get Ireland better under control, okay? So he recently had disappointed a lot of um, a lot of Scottish landowners. He had a lot of Scottish landowners that were kind of mad at him for something. It's, an, it's another story. And at the same time, he had been watching that slowly but surely in Ulster, the province in the top of Ireland, a lot of the leadership had been leaving. OK, so they've been doing the Irish in general had been doing kind of brutal war with the English for a very, very long time. And in the last sort of few decades of the um 16th century a lot of them were just so fed up that they couldn't hack it anymore and they left okay and so so james's uh cousin elizabeth the first who had been on the throne before him she had been slowly but surely giving some land in the north to her friends who were mostly english who were mostly english or scottish and who were loyal to the crown okay and so james can continue this in a big way and this is called the ulster plantation so what he would do is he would take um, a chunk of land in one of these areas that you can see up here in, in the province of Ulster and he would give it to a Scottish or an English landowner and he would say look here take it build a sort of stately home uh, get people to farm do not employ Catholics do not let Catholics on your land and let's try and make a kind of small version of England or Scotland over there and the more that we put our English and our Scottish values onto this place the less Irish it will be and the more easy it will be to control 
okay? And so obviously, if you've studied anything to do with history, you'll know that this is kind of the basic logic in colonialism, right? So this is also the kind of thing that happened in the Americas with indigenous people, was this idea that if we could make a kind of small version of England over there with English values, that would help to sort of defeat the, the local culture. So Ireland, in lots of ways, was one of the first colonial projects of the English. So he did this. So bear in mind that this happened, yeah, what are we talking about here? We're talking about 400 years ago. Okay, so I want you to kind of guard this image in, in your head um, as we go on with this presentation that 400 years ago, these Scottish and English landowners were plonked down in the north of Ireland, okay? I also, just for now, want you to look at this map and look closely at Monaghan. So you see that one of these little areas it stays green and that's because it's Irish, okay? That never got settled. So I just want you to remember that little shape and that little chunk of green that's in there, one of those provinces of Ulster. So the next kind of couple of hundred years go on pretty miserably for all of Ireland. Um, the country still hasn't been partitioned. It's still all just one country, even if there's more Protestants in the North. Um, and here we have an image from 1798, the United Irishman, Wolf Tone. It was, he, he's considered the sort of founding father of Irish Republicanism. It was an uprising against the English um, and it did not work. And Wolf Tone was captured and the day before he was supposed to be hung, he slit his own throat in Dublin. I show you this picture just to say that even in the 19th century, there was this totally rich uh, tradition of resistance towards British rule everywhere in Ireland. And as we get into the, yeah, into the late 17th century, I wanted to show you this little graphic as well that shows Irish Catholic and land ownership. And shows that even as early as 1688, Irish Catholics essentially had been disenfranchised from the land. Okay, so only in the very west of Ireland were they still holding on to land. But in most of Ireland, they were becoming really a subclass, even if they made up the absolutely overwhelming majority. Things don't get any easier in the 19th century for the Irish. In 18, uh, in the eight, in 1850, you have. Um, 1850 or 1840, I can't remember, you have the, the potato famine, and Gorta Moor, which means the great hunger in Gaelic. This is totally brutal for the country. One and a half million people die, a million emigrate. Uh, I'm sure many of you that have Irish ancestry in your families, you, your family will then emigrate to the US in mid 19th century. This is devastating for a population who are already devastated and already experiencing a lot of poverty and a lot of inequality. Famously, Queen Victoria is supposed to have only given five pounds of her personal money to the famine. In fact, apparently it's not true she gave 5,000, but there's definitely a lot of people today who would say that there was no famine, that it was manufactured by a British government that did not care enough for Irish lives to send the aid, which would have been very possible. You think the 1850s, Britain was at the height of its powers. Here in the 19th century, we have uh, Daniel O'Connell, the great emancipator, the great liberator, who's a huge figure in Catholic civil rights in Ireland. Again, we're talking about Ireland before the country was partitioned. At the time that he was born, Catholics did not have the right to vote. They didn't have the right to go to school. They didn't have the right to be educated. He was a Catholic. And by the time he died, he had been the Lord Mayor of Dublin twice. So he was a really important figure for the civil rights movement. He was a friend and colleague of Frederick Douglass, who came and visited him in Dublin. Uh, and, a, and an inspiration for people like Mahatma Gandhi and people like Martin Luther King. So he had this real sort of non-violent uh, non-violent revolutionary politic, Daniel O'Connell. And eventually we get up into the 20th century. This is the next bit. After that map, I showed you the Ulster plantation. This is the next bit you need to pay attention to to understand Northern Ireland. And we're looking at 1916 and we see this banner that says, we serve neither King nor Kaiser. Or 1914, sorry, this picture. Basically what happened is by the time they got into the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, Irish people were just so, they were so fed up of English rule, okay, all over the country, uh, in Belfast, in Dublin, in Cork, they were fed up of English rule, uh, they were fed up of being treated badly, they were fed up of not having fair, uh, their own parliament, they had to go all the way to London to, to, to serve as Congress people, they had a bad situation, and suddenly, when World War One was beginning, and the English were like, right, conscription, you're all going to go and fight in our wars, the Irish were like, what? No, we don't, we don't want to do that. Like you've been treating us like crap for literally 900 years. And now you want us to go and die in some muddy field in Europe. Like we, we don't want to do that. And so in 1916, they, they had an uprising. They had basically a revolution, the Easter rising, the 1916 Easter rising. So this is a picture in Dublin. 
And basically, in this, two very important groups formed. This is the important part. The Irish Republican Brotherhood, the IRB, and the Irish Republican Army, the IRA. So often when people hear IRA, they think just about men in balaclavas in the 1970s or 80s. In fact, in the 1910s, the IRA were already a group who were fighting for the, the freedom of Ireland from Britain. So you have the Easter Rising. Uh, it's kind of uprising against the British. Um, and then you have some of the important po political figures of the day, the Irish political figures of the day. Here you have Michael Collins in the middle and Eamon de Valera on the right. And basically in 1919, they declared Doyle Iran, the Irish parliament. So they basically say no more for the British. We don't care about this anymore. We don't want to sit in, in the parliament in London. We want to sit in the parliament in Dublin. Okay, so they do that. This then starts a war and the Irish go to war with, with the English, okay? Um, it's not a nice war, it lasts about two years. It's the war where we talk about the black and tans. Um, it's a very, very bloody war. And eventually they fight the English to the negotiating table. And they send this man, Michael Collins, to go to the negotiating table. And he goes over to London and they offer him a deal. And the deal is Ireland can go, it can be free from the UK, but the UK can keep the North, okay? and the whole of Ireland has to have the Queen. So Ireland, he comes back, he discusses with, with uh, the, the people in Doyle Iran, and people are not happy, okay? And this new revolutionary parliament in Ireland, they split. Ireland goes to civil war. There are some people who are pro-treaty, people who are anti-treaty. So basically half of the people say, look, we've been dying for two years fighting the English. Enough is enough, let's just take it. They can keep the North, like we'll try and get the North later. And the other half of people are like, are you joking? Too many of us have died for us to let them have the North. We've got to keep fighting. And eventually they fight to a point where they kind of can't really fight anymore um, until May, 1923. And what we get is this. So we get an Ireland who becomes divided. The Irish Free State is created. Uh, and up at the top, there is Northern Ireland, which will remain part of Britain. So obviously this is a compromise which made some people very happy and some people very, very sad. Um, I wanted to show you this map because this is interesting. You know the term gerrymandering? You know when people um, play with electoral boundaries in order to sort of commit, not electoral fraud, but in order to put someone into power that shouldn't be in power. This, the creation of Northern Ireland, was one of the really strongest examples of gerrymandering in history. Because if you notice, there's these four provinces, these four different colours in all of Ireland. The top one, the yellow one, is Ulster. When the British wanted to take um, Northern Ireland, it would have made a lot more sense just to take Ulster, wouldn't it, to take the whole province. But in fact, they knew that if they took Donegal and they took Monaghan, you remember I asked you to look at Monaghan earlier, which was never settled. If they knew they took if they Donegal and Monaghan, there would not be a Protestant majority, and so they didn't take them. Even in the construction of the country, the game was rigged. They wanted to draw a boundary around the area where they knew they could have a Protestant majority in order to better control Ireland. So even in the creation of that boundary, boundary, the, the game was rigged. Whew. Up until this point, also Belfast and the North, their ties to Britain had been getting much, much stronger. Okay, this is a photo from the 1910s um, in Belfast. Belfast, I, I don't know if you knew, this was the place where the Titanic was built by the shipbuilders Harlan and Wolfe. Um, and actually, by the time you got to the sort of 1910s, a quarter of all people in Belfast were employed in shipbuilding, okay? And while Catholics made up about 30% of the population in Belfast, they only made up 5% of the skilled workers. So you had the situation where people were very much employed, very much linked to the British, but Catholics were very much not in a position where they had many civil rights. So let's jump forward to the 1960s. I promise I'm not gonna do any more talking about kings or queens or the Middle Ages. Um, we're gonna talk about the modern political history of Northern Ireland now. We're gonna talk a bit about the troubles. So if we look at this picture, we are looking at the 1960s in Dublin, okay? And it looks like the 1960s type of vehicles. You can see they've got the green buses instead of the red buses. That was a big thing. All the things that are red in Britain became green in Ireland, like post boxes. Mm -hmm. Life moved on for normal. And what was happening in the world globally in the 60s, right? One of the big things that was happening is that there were civil rights movements. So in the US, you had the African-American civil rights movements, the gay liberation movement, the women's movement. And in Ireland, in the north of Ireland, you had the civil rights movement for Catholics. Okay, In 1967, the Northern Irish Civil Rights Association 
uh, was founded by Catholics who wanted to protest peacefully for their lack of sort of social rights. And 1969 really marks the beginning of the what is officially known as the Troubles, but there were two important demonstrations in these first early periods that shaped a lot of this history. The first one was in 1968. It was this one here, a civil rights march in, in Derry in Northern Ireland, which got dispersed very violently by the RUC, the police force. In the 50 days after this, there was what people call sometimes a 50 day revolution, okay, where basically Catholic neighborhoods began to riot and began to protest about the brutality of the police. And the police didn't have the numbers or really the desire to police nonviolently and responded with huge, huge, huge violence, okay. This got the attention of, of the British government, Harold Wilson's government, who wanted to put some stuff in place to try and calm down these angry Catholics in the north. Um, but there was a second demo in 1969 where they did a long march from Belfast to Derry and it got attacked by a loyalist mob okay, on the way who were supported by many, many off-duty police officers. So people started very much feeling at this point, like even if they wanted to have peaceful demonstrations about securing their civil rights, the police were against them and the police were mostly Protestants. Okay. At this point, I'm just going to take a little moment to talk about terminology because it's all a bit confusing, gets a bit mixed up. On the left at the top there, you have the Northern Irish flag. Um, and on the right, you have the, the Irish flag, the flag for the Republic. And on the left, you have these terms. So unionist, is a, the union is the United Kingdom, you're loyal to the union. Loyalist, you're loyal to the crown, to the king or the queen, and you're, you're Protestant. And you want to stay in the UK. And on the other side, you have the Republicans, which means they want a republic, so they want no monarchy. Nationalist, but Irish nationalist. Catholic, and they want to join the Republic of the Ireland. So what you have in the, in the 1960s is you have a Catholic minority in Northern Ireland who actually want Northern Ireland to rejoin the Republic of Ireland. And you have a Protestant majority who want it to very much stay part of the United Kingdom. We enter the beginning of the end of the 1960s, beginning of the 70s into a period of huge civil unrest. Okay, and people in Catholic communities feel almost, they feel under siege, all right, from the actions of the, the police. Um, and it's the beginning of paramilitary culture. So when we say paramilitary culture, we're talking about, we're starting to talk about this kind of image, okay, which is the kind of image people really associate with, with Belfast and with the Troubles. We're talking about a system where, where people feel like the police or the army are no longer serving their community's needs at all and begin to, in fact, arm themselves to try and serve their community's needs. So this happened on both sides of the divide. They were paramilitary organizations on both sides. The most famous on the Republican side is the IRA. Probably the most famous on the Protestant side is the UVF, okay? But both of them formed these illegal paramilitary organizations uh, and they were active in the end of the 1960s. At the beginning, they were kind of involved with small bombs, sometimes targeted assassinations. Um, and control of different neighborhoods. Part of the problems in these early days was that, uh, in fact, the, the loyalist paramilitaries were much more linked with the police forces. Okay, so the Catholic paramilitaries, the, the IRA, etc., they felt like they had to much more organize on their own for their own communities, whereas the loyalist side felt a little bit more linked in with, with power and with authority. It was a difficult, very difficult time to be a Catholic in Northern Ireland. Um, lots and lots of Catholics were forced out of their homes. Uh, and there were sieges of, of the Catholic areas in Belfast, which lasted days and days and days, uh, in which petrol bombs were, were thrown. There was, in fact, a very famous three-day siege in 69, where the police fired over a thousand cartridges of tear gas into a, a series of housing estates in, in Belfast. It, people say, I read a book a, a long time ago that was saying that in this three-day siege, if they had continued for two more days, Belfast would have been completely cleared of Catholics. So whilst I do want to give um, perspectives on both sides of the divide, and I will try to do that, um, I do have to say that at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, it was very, very difficult to live in a Catholic neighborhood in, in the north of Ireland. Um, hold on, actually, I'm going to stay there. The other thing that's important in this period is that people weren't just living in these neighborhoods and thinking, oh God, who are these scary, scary men with, with guns that are at the end of my street? These were very embittered communities. These were communities that had been really under the weight of quite a lot of police violence and sectarian violence for a long time. And the IRA was able to really 
draw on, on, on this idea of the IRA as being a force that could liberate. And, and they use those memories that in Ireland of 1916, okay? And the fact that, in fact, the IRA in Dublin in 1916 had in some ways delivered a free Ireland, okay? So they were saying, look, we, we're part of that history. It's 50 years has passed, but that's the same thing that we want. We want to deliver Ireland from the British. At the beginning, the, the loyalist militaries, they were doing a lot more bombings and murders, but by mid 1970s, the IRA kind of took over in terms of the quantity. And in the first five years of the 70s, there were a quarter of a million house searches and four million vehicles were stopped and searched by the British army. People really started to feel like the British army were an occupying force. The beginning of 1971, sorry, not the beginning of 19, autumn 1971, uh, internment begins. So I don't know if you know if that word is familiar to you, but internment is the, the imprisoning without trial of political prisoners for their political beliefs, which when you say it like that sounds really shocking, but which is still something that we do in, in the UK today under terror legislation and that is done in, in the United States also with Guantanamo. Uh, Guantanamo Bay. In 71, when it was introduced in Northern Ireland, it was seen as a bit of a shock. Uh, and in a raid overnight, a uh, series of raids, they arrested 342 prominent sort of Republican, um, Republican, yeah, organizers, activists, paramilitaries, and put them in this camp here. It was a former US military camp. Um, and there was a huge upsurge of violence and response to this. People were very unhappy that all of these uh, people had been suddenly taken into uh, imprisonment. Um, and people suffered a lot of torture in, in, in H block. It's called Long Kesh, this military base. People were exposed to white noise. They were deprived of food and drink. They had sleep deprivation and forced standing. And in turn, and the fact that suddenly they took all the leaders of the IRA and they put them in this camp really contributed to this idea that the IRA was an army, like it was a military force, okay? And at first they were recognized as political prisoners inside the prison. And so they were in fact allowed to, for example, organized politically to not wear prison clothes, to have meetings together, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in 1972 then, um, so the year after, in the on the 30th of January, you have something really famous and really horrible which happens in Derry, which is Bloody Sunday. Um, this is a really incredibly pixelated photograph. So I'm gonna maybe, I, can't, I couldn't get a better quality one. So maybe I put it on the mural uh, which is in, in Derry today, which is better quality. But this is the original photograph. There are actually two Bloody Sundays, interestingly, in Irish history. There's one of them that's in the first in the war against the English in the end of the 1910s, where the British police, again, opened fire into a football stadium, killing lots and lots of demonstrators. But the most famous Bloody Sunday, the one for which there's the U2 song, is this one. It's the 30th of January, 1972. Basically, there was a, a riot, uh, a demonstration, um, and the parachute regiment of the British Army, they opened fire uh, into a crowd of unarmed demonstrators and they killed 13 unarmed protesters, not a single one of whom turned out to be an IRA man. Huge rioting followed after this. Uh, of the 150 shops in Derry, only about 20 of them were left open. And this photo here is very famous. This shows a, a priest. He was a priest at the time, Edward Daly. After, after that, he actually went on to be the bishop after this. And this is him running with a blood-soaked handkerchief, trying to say, you know, surrender, surrender, while they try and get this young man, Jackie Duddy, who's 17 years old, um, who had been shot by, by a British, British soldier, while they try and get him out of the demonstration. Okay, he would, he would later go on to die. So this became one of the very iconic images of, of Bloody Sunday, was this priest waving the white handkerchief, trying to get this teenager um, some medical care. Bloody Sunday was important for lots of reasons. One, it was quite international, so it brought a lot of attention. But the other thing, kind of actually bigger even than that, was that it meant that Catholic opposition to political violence really collapsed. So after Bloody Sunday, even your kind of moderate um, Catholic families in Belfast started feeling like, look, there's nothing we can do that means that they're not going to be killing us in the streets. Okay, and so this saw a huge rise in the support uh, of the IRA and of the more the more sort of violent political tactics that were being put into place at the time. Just wanted to say a word or two about the 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 British soldiers. This whole time there had been a lot of British soldiers there. Um, it was actually the biggest uh, operation, the British British military operation since since Suez. 
Um, and some of the images that you have from Belfast at the time are totally amazing. I mean, look at this, like kids fighting the British army. I mean, I guess as well, when you, when you think about the fact that, you know, the, the history of Ireland with, with the British army with, or with the British in general goes back 900 years of kind of unwanted um, occupation. And so when you go back and you think about this, that then suddenly people had these soldiers walking in their streets that had accents from London, from Manchester, from Glasgow, from, from places that were not there. Um, you can imagine how that would really have felt like, a, like, the, like an occupation army. And so people really did not like the, the British army, certainly in, in, the, in the Catholic areas of Belfast. 1972, there was a bit of a breakdown, uh, a bit of a breakthrough even. Northern Ireland was basically on the brink of civil war and the Conservative government suspended the Northern Irish government. They were like, look, you can't even govern yourselves for now. The IRA felt like this was a bit of a breakthrough. So there was a ceasefire. They brought a bunch of, uh, a bunch of IRA, um, a bunch of IRA people uh, to the UK to negotiate, to have some kind of peace talks. Famously, Gerry Adams, who's still a political figure, was brought out of jail to go and have these talks. Um, but the truce broke down pretty, pretty, pretty fast um, when there was a big series of IRA bombs in, in, in the 21st of July, 1972. The IRA by the mid 70s were starting to lose some of the legitimacy. So they had a, a big boost after Bloody Sunday and then they lost some of it. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of a recap and then maybe we'll actually do a bit of walking around Belfast and talking specifically about sites in Belfast. But I just wanted to go over some civilian deaths. Civilian deaths, over 800 civilians were killed by loyalist paramilitaries over the troubles. Okay, and that's 700 Catholic civilians and 100 uh, Protestants mistaken for Catholics. Okay. Um, the same year that Stormont closed, that the Northern Irish Assembly closed, um, direct rule from British, from British began. And from the, the next year on, from 1974, the IRA felt like British interest was kind of diminishing in the Troubles. Um, and so they, they decided to take their campaign of bombings and assassinations to Britain. This is famously the pub in Guildford, England, that got bombed in October 1974. Uh, and that was their attempt to kind of bring... Uh, yeah, to, to bring this question back onto the map for the British public. Um, for the rest of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, the IRA continued to assassinate and bomb targets within Ireland and, and in England. And it was a bit of a war of attrition. Tactics in this whole period were very, very different. The IRA traditionally attacked police officers, uh, soldiers, politicians, etc., etc. Whereas with the, the, the loyalists, the Protestant um, paramilitary groups, their goal was much more just to, to, to kill and hurt and maim Catholics, okay? So you didn't necessarily have to have joined an army or joined the police or been a politician. The fact that you were Catholic was enough to, to warrant um, harm being done to you. Um, from the mid 90s, uh, sort of 93, 94, there were very clear peace talks going on between all the parties involved. And finally, um, in 1998, the British government, they, they managed to sit around the table with the Northern Irish political parties and they signed the Good Friday Agreement, also known as the Belfast Agreement. And basically that acknowledged that the majority of Northern Ireland wanted to remain part of the UK, but the majority of Ireland wanted a united Ireland. So basically it was like saying agree to disagree, but in a kind of binding legal document. And this document was the beginning of the devolved Northern Ireland Assembly, which even today is, is their sort of legislative body. Throughout the whole of the Troubles, 3,600 people were killed and 90% of them were killed in the hands of illegal paramilitaries. Okay, uh, About half of those deaths, 1,500 of them were in Belfast. All right, so that's a bit of history of the Troubles, um, kind of quite generally. And it brings us up to Belfast. So the, this tour was supposed to be about Belfast and the Troubles. And so I've talked quite in detail now about the Troubles. And so I'm going to talk to you about Belfast and try and show you some, some bits and pieces uh, so firstly, have a look at this map um, and look at this infographic on the side. You'll see that the very green areas are very Catholic areas and the very red areas are obviously very Protestant areas. So you'll notice firstly that the Catholic communities are very much in the west of the city. So Bel Belfast, West Belfast. If somebody says West Belfast or he had a West Belfast accent, usually that means that someone comes from the Catholic side of the divide. So have a look at that. It's mostly in the West. Also, look how some of those neighborhoods are very close to each other. So, for example, look at Falls and Shank Hill there. Shank Hill was one of the most notorious 
loyalist neighborhoods in Belfast. Falls is also one of the most famous um, Catholic neighborhoods in Belfast. And so look how close they are to each other. If you look at this next map, which is a kind of similar, similar vibe, um, you can see these red marks for peace lines between the areas where the two communities are living in very close proximity to one another. I'm going to come back to what a peace line is in a minute. If you know already, you're not going to be shocked. If you don't know already, I think you're probably quite shocked when you see what a peace line is. So we're going to start a little walk, a little walk around Belfast, and we're going to start on the Falls Road, looking at the Divis Tower. So this is the one remaining tower of what was actually a, a complex of different towers built in the 1960s um, in a traditionally Catholic working class neighborhood. Uh, 96 flats, 20 floors. Um, and it was a flashpoint for trouble uh, during the Troubles, a flashpoint for violence, this estate. Um, most famously, because this is a plaque at the base of it, this is the place where Patrick Rooney, age nine, was shot to death by the police um, in, in 1969. It was the first child uh, victim of the Troubles. Now, the context in which he was killed is really, really horrible. Basically, there had been a day of protest and rioting. And at the end of the day, when people, when, you know, when it had died down and everyone had been arrested or had gone home, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, they drove to the base of the tower, they parked, they rolled down their windows in an armored vehicle. They had a burning machine gun and they just went like this in the tower, knowing that it was only Catholics living, living inside. Uh, lots and lots of people got, got hit and took bullets. Um, but two people were killed, including this, this nine-year-old boy. There was a huge inquiry, many, much, much later, the Scarman inquiry, that found that there was absolutely no justification for them having fired into the tower. Originally, they had said they were under sniper fire, but this was found to be not true. Something else really interesting about the Divis Tower um, is that the British army, when they, when they kind of came into, into Belfast, they didn't feel safe in this neighborhood, like they couldn't get into this neighborhood. And actually even today, even at the base of the tower, when you drive there today, there's big signs that say, British army not welcome, police not welcome. And so the British army felt like they couldn't get into this neighborhood. And so what they did was they took over the top two floors of this tower, okay? So they put a helipad in. So this was how they could enter into this very Catholic neighborhood. So you imagine the first 18 floors, you have Catholic, potentially Republican families who want nothing more than the British to leave Ireland. Uh, and then on the top two floors, you have the British army. So look, here's a picture of a, a British soldier sitting on top of the Divis Tower. And then again, it's a bit pixelated, I'm sorry, but this is from a, a mural from a campaign to demilitarize uh, Divis Tower. So it was only in 2005 that they debuilt um, the, the sort of military structures that had been left on the top of the Divis Tower. Just around the corner from, from Divis, really very, very close by, this is your first glimpse at um, a peace line or a peace wall, which is in fact, yeah, you guessed it, just a massive, massive wall to keep Catholics and Protestants apart. They, they're usually between about 500 meters and five kilometers. And they're not just in Belfast, actually. They, they have them in other places in, in Northern Ireland as well. They started in the 20s. 1920s, but the ones that we have now today are mostly from the post-69 period, from, from the Troubles. And in total, there's 21 miles of them in, in Northern Ireland today. 67% of all sectarian deaths in the Troubles occurred within 500 yards of a peace line, okay? So they were really in these kind of flourishing points of the, of, of the Troubles. You can see here, for example, this is literally between people's gardens. You know, we're on the one side, maybe on the left, you have Catholic, Republican families, and on the right, you have uh, loyalist Protestant families. Um, they open in the day and they close at night. I'll show you how that happens later. And they're very, very, very high. Um, and interestingly, there's all kinds of sort of commissions and charities and groups that are set up today that are about trying to get these down. But strangely enough, about 60% of people in Belfast feel that they're necessary today, which is very, very sad. Some of them, however, have produced really um, great opportunities for mural making. And as we walk up the Falls Road, we're going to get up to the International Wall. Okay, so the International Wall is managed by its own committee who decide what's going to be on it. It's a whole bunch of murals. I haven't got them all here. You can just see, see a couple of them. But it's interesting, you're going to see a real difference between the mural culture on the Republican Catholic side of the divide and on the Protestant loyalist side of the divide. Because on the Republican side, it's much more international. It's, it's much more contemporary. It's much more connected with contemporary issues, contemporary problems. Um, 
Uh, and on the loyalist side, it's much more about the past, about the Battle of the Boyne, about the Reformation, and about idolizing um, the paramilitary organizations which were working in the 70s and 80s. So for example, here, we're still on the Republican side, we're on the Catholic side, on the Falls Road, you can see free, Obama holds the key, free Leonard Peltier. This is about the indigenous activists in the United States. You can see here, also on the international wall, this is one about black civil rights. You have Frederick Douglass there on the left, you have Martin Luther King, you have uh, Angela Davis, you have lots of Harriet Tubman, lots of different figures from, from black history. And they're also very, very um, responsive. They develop fast with time. You can hear as a coronavirus one, West Belfast supports the NHS. This will have been have done in the last year, NHS, the National Health Service. Here's one about the US in the last period of time, Black Lives Matter with Floyd George. These are really updating themselves fairly often. As we walk up the, the Falls Road as well, we'll get to this very, very famous uh, mural of this person, Bobby Sands, who's a name that you must have heard if you've heard anything about Belfast. Uh, and he has this, this quote here, our revenge will be the laughter of our children. Basically, um, Bobby Sands uh, was a hunger striker. So he was a political prisoner and a hunger striker. So the prison I talked about earlier, Long Kesh, um, basically the IRA, do you remember I was saying, had, um, they had special status in Long Kesh. So you didn't have to wear a prison uniform because you hadn't necessarily committed a crime. I mean, that's the important thing as well. You weren't arrested for a crime and put in there, you were arrested for being a member of a Republican organization. So they were allowed to wear their own clothes. They were allowed to, they had certain kind of rights that, that crim criminals didn't have in the prison system. And then in 1975, the British government decided to phase this out. Okay, and so in 76, the first prisoner, Kieran Nugent, he was brought into the prison. He was the first IRA prisoner who was told you need to wear a prison uniform. And so he refused to wear the prison uniform. He said, like, oh, I'd rather go, I'd rather go make it, you know? And so he became the blanket man. And so here's a picture of two of the blanket men. These are the IRA political prisoners in Long Kesh who refused to wear clothes because they would not wear prison. They felt like wearing a prison uniform was like saying they had done something wrong and they didn't feel like they had done something wrong. Uh, so they were known as being on the blanket. And there were about 340 of them on the blanket by 1980. The dirty protest hunger strikes. Uh, and eventually in March of 1981, they started a very big hunger strike. Okay, this is Bobby Sands um, before, he, before he was in prison. Bobby Sands was a kind of sympathetic public figure. People kind of liked the, liked the style of him. He hadn't done anything particularly violent. Uh, his family had been intimidated off the Rathcool estate in Belfast. He was a kind of acceptable face of, of militantism. And so he was in this, um, in this hunger strike. Their demands weren't, weren't massive. Um, their demands weren't massive. Their demands were basically that they wanted, uh, I mean, they had some big political demands, you know, like the self-determination of Ireland or whatever, but their demands in the prison were quite small. They wanted basically to not have to wear the prison uniform, to have the right to socialize, a visit a week, a letter a week, package a week. And so their strike was very, very, people were sympathetic to the strike. And in 1981, there was a Sinn Féin MP, Frank Maguire, so like a, a politician who was sympathetic to the IRA, who died. And so the political party had to replace him to, for someone to, to fill his seat in, in the parliament. And so this idea started, like, why don't we try and put Bobby Sands? Why don't we try and elect him, basically as the equivalent of a, of a congressman, but from hunger strike? Um, so here he is on hunger strike. And so then basically what happened was on the 9th of April, uh, in 1981, he was elected as a serving official, and on the 5th of May, as a serving official, he died on hunger strike. Um, and so, he, yeah, here's his funeral in, in, in Belfast with, with, with members of the IRA uh, being involved in carrying his, his coffin. So you can imagine it's quite a compelling story, certainly also from an international media perspective, that basically an elected official died on, on hunger strike for, for their beliefs. Now we're going to cross over into the other side. So we've seen a little bit about the sort of Republican mural history and culture on the Catholic side of the divide. And this is what the gaps in the peace lines often look like. They're like these big gates uh, and they close at night to stop people, you know, when they've had a drink or two or to stop kids in the evening looking for trouble. Uh, and they're open during the day. They do open and close and it's with a centralized police camera system now that they control them. I have actually been driving in Belfast in the night where we haven't been able to go through where we wanted to because the peace lines have closed. So that's still very much part of the culture today. So now we cross into uh, Shank Hill and into um, the Protestant side of the divide. You can see even just little things that are part of this whole symbology of this divided community. You can see that, for example, that the, the railings are all blue here. 
So, for example, you wouldn't really get that in a Catholic neighborhood. The roads would be black or they'd be green, but they wouldn't be blue. And you look at some of their murals, you know, we can see here this Protestant mural to the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, John Wesley. Uh, or you see these kinds of murals where they're, they're more linked to paramilitary, paramilitary violence. Or this, this is the, the really big sort of, uh, yeah, the really big sort of obsession, which is um, King William, King William of Orange, who famously beat, uh, beat, famously won the battle against James II, the Battle of the Boyne in 1688. Uh, as the really big sort of figure for Protestants in Northern Ireland. And you can see also up there this, um, this banner, British and proud. And you think you would just never see that. I mean, anywhere in the Republic of Ireland, certainly, you would never see that in a Catholic neighbourhood. It's a very specific thing to the Protestant neighbourhoods in, 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 in the cities of Northern Ireland. In fact, today, there's a statistic that two thirds of all Protestants in Northern Ireland feel British, but only one tenth of all Catholics feel British. Here's another one, East Belfast Brigade. Our message to the Irish is simple, hands off Ulster, Irish out. Um, and the other big thing that, 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 is, that is known to, to, to cause problems also today, but has been traditionally has been a thing, has been bonfire season. So the, the 12th of July is the, the Battle of the Boyne. It's this big battle in, in Protestant history, but a battle that happened, I mean, hundreds of years ago. And so historically in the Protestant communities, they have these very, very big bonfires. And often they have these big orange marches and it's a bit of a problem. I mean, they often degenerate into, into violence. Uh, and the sort of Catholic position for a long time has been have your marches, have your bonfires, but just have them in your neighborhoods. Because in fact, often they'll have these bonfires and then they'll have marches which will go through the Catholic neighborhoods and this will search out trouble and violence will escalate. So these are pallets and those are kids sitting on top. So you can see the size of this bonfire. And these can be not very nice affairs. They'll often burn Irish flags. They'll burn symbols of Ireland. And in fact, here, you know, you can see they're going to burn a, a, an Irish flag with IRA written on it. And they're also going to burn this Irish flag with K-A-T written on it which stands for kill all tags. And a tag is like a, a, a word for Irish or for Catholic. It's basically like a, a big Irish flag which says kill all Catholics on it. So you can see it's not, doesn't leave a very nice taste in the mouth. And so there's still a, a big movement of, of, like there's still a big movement today. I mean, there's much, 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 much less uh, violence of the levels that were during the period of the Troubles, but there's still a movement of, of Protestants in the north of Ireland who really want Britain to, to, to keep its grasp on Northern Ireland. Um, in the same way that there's still Catholic communities in the north of Ireland who, who would like your Ireland to unify. How this all changes and gets together with the Brexit, I'm up for discussing if you ask questions about afterwards, because it's, it's very interesting. And a lot of these protests and a lot of these sort of movements are about flags. So, for example, there's the British flag. These will be Protestant loyalists flying the British flag. Often the flag flying then causes periods of rioting or periods of demonstrations. And so whenever basically the local council tries to step in to regulate who can fly which flags when, that always leads to kind of trouble. People, people are very, very sensitive about, about flags in Northern Ireland. One of the other ways it comes over into modern life is through football. Um, this is uh, Celtic and Rangers. This is in Scotland, actually. This is what I was saying about one of the ways in which this kind of sectarian history bubbles over into Scotland or into other parts of the world is that this is still the big football rivalry in Glasgow between Celtic and Rangers. Celtic, who are more traditionally associated with Catholic or Republican communities, and Rangers in blue there, uh, who are more traditionally associated with Protestant um, Protestant or loyalist communities. And that still plays out in a, in a, in a big, big way. You know, in Scotland, people do a lot of... Um, you know, asking you subtle questions to try and figure out which side of the divide you're on. And as soon as people meet someone from Northern Ireland, they're trying to figure out which of this divide does someone come from. And that's something that gets figured out through lots of little gestures, little words, little comments. But it's really a, a kind of pretty constant preoccupation in people's minds, even today. It comes from Belfast today has also this other side where there is a, a much younger generation who are growing up. I mean, for example, most of the students I work with now, you know, they, you know they're, they're born after 2000, you know, they're born even after the Good Friday Agreement. So they're less kind of weighed down by this bitterness uh, and they're ready for Belfast to, to be something else. So Belfast also in lots of ways is a kind of really modern, uh, a modern city trying to kind of get through its trauma and move forward to, to show the world something else about itself. This is Donegal Square in the center of Belfast. And that involves attracting tourists as well. There's been about, there's about 5 million tourists visit Belfast a year. It is wild because, I mean, really, 
25 years ago, there just were not tourists going to Belfast. It was not considered it was not considered safe at all for people to visit. And now, you know, it has changed a lot in the last 20 years. This is the big Titanic Museum, which opened in, in 2012, which obviously is a huge, huge boost for tourism. And these days in Belfast, there's really a lot of nice sort of museums and parks and restaurants and, and things to do. Outside of those communities, it's very possible to visit Belfast and not see uh, this history. But in some ways, I feel like that's a lot less interesting, right? It's like you want to see Belfast for, for everything that is Belfast, not just for a certain side of it. I want to show you also this. It's also a place I really like to take groups in, in Belfast, St. George's Market. It's like the, the biggest and oldest covered Victorian market, actually in all of, in all of Ireland. Um, used as a mortuary in World War II, uh, and they had separate sections for Catholic bodies and for Protestant bodies. I always think that was a real little Belfast story. Um, Belfast actually was really strongly affected by the Blitz. It was the worst damaged place outside of London um, during the bombing of, of the UK by, by the Nazis. Um, I've been talking for slightly longer than I planned to, uh, but I'm coming to the end of the presentation. I hope it's been interesting, or I hope you've learned some things. Um, I think if, uh, there are some people that really want to stay in this history forever and not think about where Belfast is at today. And I think there are other people that really want to only think about where Belfast is at today and try and avoid thinking about some of this history. And I think part of the task is, is to balance those two things, right? And to try and uh, yeah, understand Belfast as the sum of its parts. Um, so I guess if any of you have any questions, you're really welcome to ask them and I'll do my, my best to, to answer them. Um, and I also just wanted to say again, as ever, a massive, massive thank you to Mara, um, who has done so much for us uh, guides over this last year and has made it possible for us to work a little bit in, in this pandemic. So massive thank you to you, Mara. Well, you're very welcome, Lewis. And Obviously I should have turned on my light before I got on here um, because the darkness has come. So um, I wanna thank you. And I'm gonna put this into a little bit of perspective for people. Um, I'm 56. When I was 20, I studied abroad and I lived in London for a while, but my goal was to tour as many countries as I could in the world. My mom is an educator. So she gave me two restrictions. Do not go to Egypt and do not go to Northern Ireland. That was in 1984. And last year, 2020, 2019, before travel stopped, I took a tour of about 38 people to Scotland and Ireland and spent much of our time in Northern Ireland. So you can tell how things have changed and what restrictions, you know, what restrictions have been lifted and how the world is is coming about. So it was so nice to be able to see a place that I really couldn't go to or was was asked kindly by my mother not to visit when I was young because of how of how violent it was at that time. So that kind of puts the the travel perspective into place for people. And I'm sure there's a lot of people on this tour tonight that probably are in the same situation. If you visited Ireland and and that, um, that region in the 80s and the 90s, you certainly stayed clear of Northern Ireland because you were afraid. Um, but, but then, you know, in the last five years, maybe 10 years, Lewis, it's really opened up. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to take a look at the Q&A. I'm already, I'm already see, deep, I'm already deep in the Q&A. You're anymore. deep into it. Okay, good. Because I'm going to put myself on mute as you start to read the questions and answer it. And I'm going to turn the light on behind me so that I can uh, actually be seen as well. Um, okay, I've got 90 questions here. So I'm obviously not going to be able to answer them all, but I'm going to give a really good shot at answering a bunch of them. Okay. Uh, question from Ronnie, how much did the Troubles occur in Dublin? The troubles didn't occur in Dublin. There, there was really nothing like that in Dublin. I mean, just in the sense that the Troubles was about a Catholic minority fighting against their sort of disenfranch disenfranchisement and their loss of civil rights. And in fact, there was not a Catholic minority in Dublin. There was a massive Catholic majority. Um, I think also the political direction that the Republic of Ireland took was a much more left-wing political direction than what, what Britain has been on. And so it was, yeah, there wasn't that in, in, um, in Dublin. Why were the police invariably Protestant? 
I guess that it's re it's relevant to this same question. Uh, yeah, about kind of who has the power in this period. Uh, and, you know, at the very base of the idea um, of Northern Ireland was this idea about making a place that would be fundamentally Protestant. You know, that's an idea that goes back 400 years. And so if you have Catholics who are in a minority, who have less civil rights, who have um, poor access to education, to healthcare, to everything, they're just not going to be very represented in the, in the police force. Um, in the same way that if you think about how uh, maybe at the beginning of the African-American civil rights movement, you know, there were just very, very, very few African-American cops. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Can you talk about how Wales and Scotland fit into this scene? Pat Cameron, I like this question, this scene. Um, Scotland's... It's complicated. It's really, really, really complicated. It depends what kind of family you come from. It depends what kind of political background you come from. Um, the, all of these tensions that are so present in Northern Ireland are so replicated in Scotland, like because of so many people from both the Republic and the six counties have moved to Scotland. Um, so it depends. I'd like to, me personally, obviously I'd be absolutely chuffed if there was a united Ireland, if, if, they, if, they, if the country reunited. And I'd like to think that that's true for most Scots, but I, I could be wrong. Um, Wales, who knows? I find, find it really difficult to understand what, what Wales thinks about all of these questions to do with sovereignty in the UK just now. Um, it's a COVID-19 question in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Are they open for tourism? Are key tourist places and restaurants open? Is proof of vaccination required? Is quarantining upon entry in both countries necessary? It's all, excuse my language, screwed still. It's really, <laughs> no, nothing's open. Restaurants are closed. There's not even, um, there's not even this requirement for vaccinations because people haven't had their vaccinations yet, you know, like, no. And in the UK, I don't know how they're doing it with the quarantine system in Ireland, but in the UK just now, they have a system where it's like, you have to stay in a state mandated hotel for two weeks and it costs something like 1700 euros or something, 1700 pounds. So no, they're very, very much um, blo blocked up for now. Um... Did the younger generation, this is a question from Lynn Jordan, did the younger generations have the same strong feelings as their elders about the divisions between the Irish people or are they more amenable to a cooperative environment? A really good question. Like I said, I think this new generation that are growing up now that are in their teens or in their early 20s are much, much less bogged down by the weight of this. And for the generation above them, it's unimaginable to think about Belfast or to think about life without thinking about these questions. But often what we see with this kind of trauma is that it skips a generation a little bit. So, so it'll be interesting to see how that changes more and more. But a big part of this, and actually this will answer another question that I view that, that I saw that's further down about segregation. Uh, a big part of this question of how young people feel is to do with segregation. And actually schools are still very, very segregated in the North of Ireland. So there's still a lot of segregation between Catholic and Protestant schools. And when you talk to people, I've met over the years, a lot of people involved in sort of reconciliation work uh, about bringing together people from both sides of the divide, working with ex-political prisoners. The, the thing, the really common thing that people say about how the North can move past this, it's always about desegregating schools. Because actually, if you're playing every single day in school with only Protestant kids and hearing about how rotten Catholics are, or you're playing every day with only Catholic kids and you're hearing about how rotten Protestants, you've maybe never even met someone from the other side of the divide. And obviously when we don't meet the people that our society is demonizing, that helps us to demonize them a lot. So I think desegregation is definitely a, a big key. Um, does Divis Tower exist today still with all Catholics? Yes. Um, it still exists today. I couldn't guarantee that it's all Catholic, but it's still in the Falls, which is an incredibly, a very, very, very Catholic neighborhood. So yes. Um, uh, the Brexit negotiation, negotiations seem to prompt increased violence in Northern Ireland. Has the final decision for the UK to leave the EU led to more calm or is the tension still building? That's a question from Lynn Jordan. Super, super complicated, right? So basically, 
with Brexit, like in the Good Friday Agreement, there was this agreement that the border between the six counties and the Republic of Ireland would always be a soft border, so it wouldn't be a controlled border. And that was fundamental part of getting a peace agreement between the two countries. And obviously when Brexit came up, the sudden worry was like, oh my God, actually, if Brexit happens and the UK leaves Europe, that means that the border between the Republic and Ireland and the UK is the border into Europe and therefore we have to control it. And therefore that threatens the peace process. So very, very, very confusing. Uh, and the backstop, like the, the things put into the law to try and protect that border from, from having to be a hard border was one of the significant, significant, significant discussions in the Brexit debate. Uh, who knows, really, really who knows. But interestingly, they have figured something out. There is a kind of system now where they have a, there's still a customs union or trade can still happen. The border is still uncontrolled. But I think that mixed with the fact that I think Scotland will try and use Brexit to push for independence, mixed with the fact that the Catholic population is, is getting bigger and bigger in Northern Ireland, means that I think that a vote on a unified Ireland in, in the next 10, 15 years is not completely unforeseeable. Um, I have a good question. I'm reading from the chat. Are yeah. the schools segregated because um, the because Catholic children go to Catholic schools as opposed to Catholic kids go to public school? Or yeah, really they're segregated in that way, but they're also segregated in just like a really basic geographical area, right? Is that, for example, if you think about yeah, like like the bog side in Derry, which is a very Catholic area. It's like it's a big area. It's a big working class area. They need to have a big school. Everybody that goes to that school is going to be Catholic. And so, yes, there is a Catholic education system, but also just the geographical thing that communities are so segregated and people go to school in their own communities. So the two things kind of feed into each other. Um, Diane Winters asks, are the political murals ever painted over for new ones? Yeah, really often. That's what I was saying at the very beginning about this culture of painting over and over and over, really often. And for example, the international wall changes constantly. I mean, really every time I go, there's new murals there. Is there a hierarchy, Lewis, in terms of how do you know what you can paint over? And is there ever violence yes. against that too? Yeah, and you do not want to mess with it. You couldn't just go and be like, I'm going to do a mural. Like you might really... <laughs> someone might have a very severe talking to with you. Um, no, for example, there's a commission for the, you know, there's like a group that's been organized since a long time that take care of the international wall. You would never just walk into Belfast and be like, I'm gonna paint a mural. There'd always be the right people to talk to, the right things to sort out. Uh, Janet Johnson, I've already answered this question. Um, that has been answered. Do you know what the ethnic background is of modern day Protestant Irish? Are they Scots, British, other? Really, really commonly people will say Scots, Irish. Uh, and often if people say that they have, often Americans, this is something I noticed, often people from the US, if they say they have Scots, Irish family, and that doesn't mean just that they have Irish family and Scot Scottish family, often that means they come from Protestant families. Um, because obviously Scottish and Irish are, are very different things. And so often when someone says Scotch Irish, that could mean, uh, that, could mean that they come from, from, from Northern Ireland and from the Protestant side of the, of the divide. Do people in Northern Ireland usually refer to themselves as just British or would they qualify as I'm British, but from Northern Ireland or something like Northern Irish? <sighs> complicated, right? I mean, it's really, really complicated. So for example, someone who is from a Catholic community from Northern Ireland would probably just say I'm Irish. They'd say I'm Irish, but me as a Scottish person, I'd hear from their accent that they were from the North because the accent is very different. And I would then be able to imagine that they were probably Catholic uh, or at least sim sympathetic to Republican ideas. Whereas someone from the North who would say uh, I'm British, I, you know, we're, we're reading these things in so many small gestures all the time. There's a very clear accent from the North, like from Northern Ireland. Um, I definitely don't think you could, or me personally, I definitely couldn't tell the difference between an accent from a more Catholic community or a more Protestant community, but you could tell by the types of words people used or the types of conversations they were having with you. Um, 
So for example, often people from the Protestant side of the divide will really make an effort to say Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland. Whereas people from the Catholic side will say maybe more the North of Ireland, or they'll say the six counties, right? To, to kind of bring us back to this idea that it's been separated from the, from the bulk of Ireland. Um, there's two questions here from Elizabeth Walsh and David Sobelson, both about the likely effect of Brexit on Irish reunification. Like I said, who knows? I, 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 it's not. It's more and more imaginable. I would say as the time as the time goes on. Um, dun, dun, dun. So bre Brexit is a positive impact on unification. On unification, I would yeah. say yes. Yeah, yeah, I would say yes. Um, lots of questions about Brexit. Oh, that's good. Is there a designated end to the trouble to the troubles, like from a um, a year standpoint, or do you people say do you talk about historically that it's people say the signing the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in nineteen ninety eight okay. is technically the end. I mean, to, in lots of ways, it still goes on, but that's the official sort of bureaucratic end to it. Um, question there was: Were the peace walls built by the loyalists to reduce the violence, or were they built by the republicans? Built by the police. Uh, built by the police and by the municipalities, in fact, yeah, to try to try and control uh, incidences of violence. Uh, Brexit, Brexit. Are the issues the same in Derry as Belfast? Yes, I mean, the issues in their base are the same. The cities are not the same. And so the issues express themselves in different ways. Derry is really, 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 nice place to visit. I would very strongly recommend visiting Derry. I always have a really nice time in Derry. Here's another tip about um, how you can tell which side of the divide someone is from, is that someone from the Protestant side of the divide or the loyalist side of the divide would never say Derry. They would always say London Derry, which is the official name, but someone from the Catholic or the Republican side would only ever say Derry because you wouldn't want to say London because that links it to Britain. So I would definitely recommend visiting Derry. Lewis, uh, do you have any movies or books that you would recommend as an extension to your presentation? Oh, God. Ah, there's a good film called, oh my God, what's it called? I feel like it's called Hunger. That's about the, hold on. Let me see if I can just see it very, very fast. Um, that's about the hunger strikers in Long Kesh film I think from 2009 hold on let me check yeah hunger um by Steve McQueen um it's a really incredibly incredibly depressing film uh, about that period of time there's a really good film with ah no do you know what yeah I do have a couple of films right so hunger by Steve McQueen there's a good film with um oh my god what's he called Daniel Day-Lewis uh, called, I believe, The Boxer, where he's a boxer boxing in, I could be really mixing two Daniel Day-Lewis films up, but I feel like there's a really good one where he's a boxer in The Troubles. There's another good one with Cillian Murphy that's in The Troubles. Oh, if God, you want to uh, forward those on to me before yeah. I send out the follow-up email Let's tomorrow, I can include them in the email. Instead of you watching me Google them on my phone live, <laughs> 1,000 people, so yeah, you're right. Um, population of Belfast is, I think it's about 280,000, uh, but maybe closer to half a million in the sort of bigger, bigger area. I wouldn't, I don't have the population of Northern Ireland right on the top of my, of my, of my head. Val Dean Vega, does the civic government of Belfast work with all that division? The short answer is no, <laughs> no, really no. And uh, lots and lots of points, they've gotten to these kind of roadblocks with their political culture where it has been impossible. Even in the last five, six years, there's been moments where the, the, the Northern Irish Assembly Stormont has closed because they cannot reach agreements on things. Um, I think Brexit just throws more of a spanner in all of that, um, which at least maybe will make things, will make things um, move instead of just stagnating and turning in circles all the time. 
how big is the BAME community in Belfast and how does it relate to the two communities? Um, I would say small, but not inexistent. Um, yeah, I would say small, but not, not non-existent. And I would say that traditionally in the Republican communities, uh, positions at least are taken a lot more against racism. Um, and traditionally it's something that is um, accused of or thrown at um, the loyalist communities that they're racist or that they're bigoted. So I would say that there's definitely one side of the divide that maybe has better relationships with, with uh, people of color, which I mentioned is what the question is about. How about uh, some foods, uh, some cultural things? Uh, and anything specific between the North and the Republic in terms of foods? Do they tend to be more English, uh, UK yeah. based as opposed to yeah. Irish? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, personally, I mean, I'm from Scotland, so I'm allowed to say it, but like Scotland, England, Ireland, we're just not hot for the food. That's just not <laughs> something we, we do. We do well. Um, and I feel like in Ireland, there's like a certain, in the Republic of Ireland, there's a certain kind of food vibe you can get on. It's a bit like Irish beef stew. And yeah, I don't know, that feels a bit Irish. And I feel like in the North, it's less that. It feels maybe more in line with, yeah, like English food culture. It's like really good fish and chips and like cakes and that kind of stuff. But I'm not going to pretend that there's like a sort of really good food, food culture. There is more and more in Belfast though, like a good restaurant culture. So there's a lot more international food, there's food stalls, food trucks, like you can get really nice food, but the kind of like indigenous food culture of Northern Ireland, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend it's like, it's, it's one of its selling points. Um, do Northern Irish Catholics have better political representation today? Yes. Yeah, short and simply, yes. Uh, how safe is it to visit Belfast now? Is there still conflict? Very, very, very safe to visit Belfast. Um, I mean, these things, it's like, uh, things have changed so much. I mean, it's definitely possibly, probably possible to see Belfast in a non-safe way. You know, like if you put on a certain football jersey and walked into the wrong pub and started shouting the wrong thing, like you probably get yourself beaten up. But in terms of visiting as a tourist and seeing the sights and being able to look around, no, it's very, very safe, yeah. Um, Someone point here from Mary Hushton about the cabs. There's like really, really this thing with, with black taxi cabs where a lot of ex-IRA men went on to drive black taxi cabs. And so a really popular thing to do, which is really actually worth doing in Belfast is to just call a black taxi and then be like, will you show us around West Belfast? and then let them show you around West Belfast. It's really only on the Republican side of things. Often they'll do a bit of like a hoo-ha and they'll be like, oh, normally I don't go into a Protestant area, but I'll do it just for you. And they're really they're really dramatic. Like they really up their stories. And you know, sometimes they'll be like, oh, and this is a bullet that was pulled out of my leg. And this is a tear, tear gas grenade that I uh, found in my car. Or, you know, like that's a really a good thing to do. A lot, a lot of groups that I've taken have, have spent long evenings in the backs of black cabs in, in West Belfast. Um, is it true that people born in Northern Ireland are considered Irish by the Republic by virtue of being born on the island? Yes. This is a really interesting one as well. So I have like a, a basically if you're a Catholic Oh, you're from the yeah from from that side of the divide in Northern Ireland. You've probably and you've got a passport. You've probably got a, an Irish passport. So you you maybe have a British one and you'd have an Irish one. But most Catholic people would ask for an Irish one in case and also to affirm their their feeling of Irishness. You can imagine on the Protestant side of the divide, they don't want those Irish passports, right? Because that would be like conceding to being part of Ireland. But one of the really funny things is that Brexit means that lots of the people in the Protestant community are, are freaking out about not having rights to the Eurozone anymore. So for the first time in the, in the Protestant community, you're having massive waves of people asking for Irish passports. Does Ireland have enough infrastructure and economy to stand alone without the UK? Excellent question. Uh, Northern Ireland, definitely not. The whole of Ireland, yeah. I mean, Ireland, the Republic of Ireland now, is standing alone. You know, like they, they are standing alone. And their economy is not, you know, the most powerful in the world, but they're not completely screwed either. Um, and so I don't, I don't see why, why they wouldn't be able to yet. Yeah. 
Why are the gates still closed in the evenings? I think because usually the evening is the time where, for example, a riot could could happen or people get a bit drunk and they want to go looking for trouble or when young people are out looking to have a fight. More difficult to police, more likely to have trouble. Um, too dangerous to ring. Why would the Catholics even want to unite the entire country? Why would they want to be united with the Protestants at all? Is it not better to remain separate? That question is from Lynn. I imagine you're asking there about Catholics in the Republic. I think, I think the idea is just that like most people in Ireland, really most people in Ireland have always wanted a united Ireland. I mean, it, no matter how you look at it, for, for me anyway, it just doesn't make sense that there's this sliver at the top of the country that is, that, that's caused by this historical anomaly 400 years ago. It's like, I guess it's interesting because the position of, of loyalist Protestants in the North often is like, go away Catholics. You know, this is a Protestant place, go away. But the position of Catholics in the South isn't go away Protestants, it's just let us govern Ireland, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question. Was there an impact on Northern Ireland from the immigration like there was on the Republic? From, from what immigration? Well, from, I guess the, the, um, the, the times that the Irish left Ah, Ireland I mean, for North America, did yeah. it impact Northern Ireland the same way as it impacted the Republic? I mean, the big, big periods of immigration were all before the country was even partitioned. So yes, yeah, you know, in the potato farm, people left from everywhere, everywhere in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, Here's a question. Where was the Good Friday Agreement signed? Oh, God, that's almost like a trick question. That's uh, sorry. Question. Sorry, I put you out there. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you. That's embarrassing. No, it's got to be in Belfast. It must be. It's called the Belfast Agreement. I don't know. That's really... No, you got me. I'm ashamed. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I just, I'm aware that a lot of late questions are coming in. So I'm trying to get down and see mm -hmm. some of them also. There's some really good recommendations. 66 Days, Dairy Girls is a, um, is a Netflix um, series. Say Nothing is a great book. Really good uh, user input. Thank you to everybody out there. In the name of the father, the boxer, is that ah, the one? Yeah. That's the one. This is like, we had one like this before when I did a tour with you, Mara, where it was a question I didn't have. And then in the chat, it was going crazy. Yeah. It was a kind of dessert, if I remember rightly. Um, yeah, in the name of the father, that's a good movie. Um, what is one major tragedy that you did not mention? God, that feels like a really trick question. I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. Um, ah, I like that. The British, from Rita O'Hara, the British government and their collusion in the cover-ups of the deaths of Catholic innocents is still going on to this day. After 40 years, still no justice. Not a question, just a fact. Agreed, Rita. I'm going to have to copy the, uh, the Q&A, all the, all the books and movies out to share with people. Um, please tell us about, <laughs> please tell us about the Sinn Féin and their role in Northern Ireland. Sinn Féin is a, is a, a, a political party that want quite simply um, a unified Ireland. Uh, Sinn Féin means we ourselves in, in Gaelic and they've been powerful in, 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 the Northern, in, in Northern Ireland for a long time. Gerry Adams, the leader of, of, of Sinn Féin uh, and so they're the, the principal party that is arguing for reunification. Um, oh. Someone's asking um, about the negotiations for the peace treaty. There's said to be an American politician that was very active in that. Yeah, there is. And I can't remember who it is. Um, I'm sure someone in the chat can tell yeah, us. Yeah, somebody answer it for us and then we'll yeah, share somebody it. Somebody answer it for us. <laughs> 
George Mitchell. Is George true? Mitchell? Ah, oh, okay, thank you. God, that was fast. Yeah, they're fast. Fantastic. I'm not going to be able to say this right, but on the Canadian standpoint, um, Deschancelier oh, and Liang, Deschancelier. I don't know how to say that. I'm sorry, I'm butchering that. Can you spell it to me? D E and then C H A S T E L A I N. Well, no, I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. Is there farming in Northern Ireland? Are there natural places to visit? Yeah, there's loads and loads of farming in Northern Ireland. Um, lots of farming in Northern Ireland and lots of really, really nice natural places to, to visit. Like probably the most famous in Northern Ireland that people, lots of people visit is the Giants Causeway. Mara, I imagine you've been there. Yes, it was awesome, yeah. Really beautiful. If you Google Giants Causeway, that's a really famous place to, to visit. Yeah. That's a nice hike and uh, a nice treat at the end of the hike. What's what about the Game of Thrones? Ah, uh, yeah. Do you know what? <clears throat> There's like some of that, these hedges. I've never even seen Game of Thrones, right? But groups are obsessed with Game of Thrones. And there's these, ah, the dark hedges. That's what it's called. I had this one group that were really like, this is not for discussion. We have to go to the dark hedges. And it really, I have to say, it did ruin my well-planned day and the itinerary. And we went to the dark edges and it has now been like everything totally um, commercialized. And you now have to like pay to park in front of the special hotel, there's a massive gift shop. And if I remember right, when we were there, there was a storm and like lots of the trees had fallen. That It was quite disappointing. But yeah, I have been to there. The dark hedges is the big, that's the big famous Game of Thrones site that's in, that's in Northern Ireland. Um, and isn't there a castle from the Outlanders in the north? Ah, well? yeah. They're... From Outlander or from Game of Thrones? Oh, is it from Game of Thrones? I haven't seen either, so I'm I'm telling I'm giving it away right now too. That I'm. Uh, thank you, Caroline. One point nine million is the population of Northern Ireland. God, really, a lot of people have helped me out with this Daniel Day Lewis films, film. I second that Roy Smith, The Wind That Shakes the Barley, excellent film, but about the Civil War. So about the sort of the, some of the conditions that led up to the partition of Ireland. Really, really, really excellent film. Again, like Hunger, not for the faint hearted. Yes, Bushman's Distillery is close to the Giant's Causeway. We went to a distillery um, as well when we were there, but. Um. Do Protestants and Catholics intermarry in current times? I'm guessing this is rare. Yeah, it does happen, but it is shockingly still rare. I read somewhere it's like less than 5% intermarriage now. And often I feel like when you hear about, when you, when you do hear about intermarriage, one person has to kind of quit their side of the divide. Ah, that's true, Andrew Gelb. That's a good point. That's another, like, which side of the divide are you on code is about whiskey. But I can't remember which one is which, Bushmills and Jameson. Jameson like, is oh, no, definitely Jameson Republic. Is Republic. Bushmill <laughs> is, is the North. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can see the Bushmills distillery now in my head with the little British soldier thing outside. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Ah, yeah, that, I don't know if I would recommend that. Someone's talking about The Milkman by Anna Burns. Gail Davenport is talking about that. It won a lot of prizes in the UK. It's this kind of quite surreal novel, kind of about the troubles. That's maybe worth a read. That's more contemporary. Oh, um, uh, here's an interesting question. Where do religions fall that aren't Catholic or Protestant? Ah, okay, well, I can tell you a joke, in fact. Um, okay. There's a bit of a joke in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland that's like... Um, so, you know, if like if you'd be hitchhiking or something, you'd be picked up in a car that you didn't know. And, and you know, they'd ask you if you were Catholic or Protestant. And, you know, a lot of people met their ends in ways like that, you know, of like being in, in not very nice situations with strangers that want to know which side of the divide you're from. And then you're from the wrong side. 
And so there's a bit of a joke about, you know, the person gets picked up hitchhiking and they say like, oh, are you a Catholic or you're a Protestant? And the person says, oh, I'm Jewish. And then they say, yeah, but are you a Catholic or a Protestant Jew? <laughs> <laughs> to say that to say that it's not really about religion it's more about like your kind of cultural values and so i think when i think about like other other religious uh communities in, in northern ireland like for sure they're represented and they're there and they face the same issues or non-issues that they do elsewhere in ireland or elsewhere in the uk but the catholic protestant thing is like really yeah it's like oh you're muslim but are you catholic or protestant muslim um just that always makes me makes me laugh about that um, is there gun control where they taken away in the UK and in Ireland you don't really, you don't have the right to you know nobody has a handgun there's no we don't have the right to guns it's not gun control it's just they never had we would never have had that so the fact that there were paramilitaries with sort of assault rifles was, was very much a big deal in a country where those guns are not not readily available at all um I feel like you've been through the questions pretty well. Do you think you've um, attacked most of them? Yeah, I think so. I think so. This is great. Thank you, Lewis. What I will do um, to make sure that I follow up well and give you more references is I will put together a list of the references of books and movies and we'll follow up with our um, in our follow up email and give you some of that information so that you can continue your um, your interest in this region. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, mostly, I want to thank Lewis for bringing his expertise and his knowledge to us. Um, as we all know, it takes a lot longer to prepare for a virtual tour than it does a physical tour. Um, so we really appreciate your time and energy on that. And to all of the audience, thank you so much for being here. If you weren't here, we would not be doing this. So thanks again and um, have a good day, night or evening. We'll see you next week.